For the first speaker will be Diego Mejia Lemos, sitting here next to me, and uh, he's coming all the way from Singapore, that, where he works at the National University of Singapore. Um, he uh, is there a postdoctoral fellow, but before coming to, uh, to, to Singapore, he worked at the Permanent Court of Arbitration <coughs> in Hague, and, uh, and especially in the field of international investments uh, arbitrations. Uh, that is, I think, I will limit myself to that short introduction um, and um, give him the floor and he will kick off this seminar with a, the, the broader perspective on customary international law, your fascist our, our, uh, our uh, knowledge of customary international law, the way it is. Uh, <coughs> used in international uh, law and especially will come to the questions of interpretation. The floor is yours, uh, Diego. Well, thank you so much. Um, find my slides. <coughs> so um, while I find my slides, I'd like to um, start by thanking um, the University of Groningen, Panos and his team for uh, organizing this event that in a way came about um, in a relatively short period of time, but I'm glad to see that so far we are in such a nice venue and we have this uh, excellent um, combination of speakers. Now turning to my uh, presentation today, um, what I in intend to do is provide a, um, a general uh, overview of uh, customary international law um, from the point of view of general public international law and then from that perspective, address some general issues that arise in the identification and interpretation of CIL in, in international investment law. Uh, this, this, this presentation will be divided into three parts and um, okay, made a mistake here, <laughs> technical, technical problem. Um, oh, I turned it. Oh, here we go. So, uh, turning to the first part of the presentation, uh, I have tried to provide uh, an overview of general issues as they arise, uh, and I'll be turning to three aspects uh, of these issues, which are what we could call the general properties of CIL in general public international law, uh, its identification and its interpretation, which is the, at the core of uh, Panos' project here. Um, speaking of general properties, there are three elements, there are three aspects that are worth discussing. Uh, the nature of CIL, its elements, and its function, you could say. Turning to the nature of CIL, there, are, uh, there is a great number of debates uh, in terms of the philosophy, the methodology of research, and the theory of CIL. But the, perhaps one very interesting issue is the very uh, reason why we speak of uh, identification instead of using other categories. So previously, to uh, give an example, the United Nations ILC, which uh, is the uh, UN organ in charge of codification of international law, conducted an earlier uh, study on CIL and that project was uh, re referred to as formation and evidence of CIL. The ILC more recently took, uh, uh, revisited uh, CIL and under a new special rapporteur, Sir Michael Wood, whom I had the luck to have on my, uh, um, on my um, examining panel for my dissertation per, uh, uh, thesis. Um, he is leading this, this new effort and he has, what well, the ILC under his uh, rapporteurship decided to go for identification. Oh, it's, it's 2 p.m. It means that I have more, I still have 50 minutes <laughs> due to the efficiency of our chair. So um, one interesting aspect of the nature of CIL is whether one looks at CIL as a process of lawmaking or as an outcome. And when I mean outcome, I refer to CIL as a set of rules, or CIL as the actual source that gives birth to those rules. And it may be uh, good to re be reminded of this distinction between um, uh, act and rule, which is a distinction that Kelsen at some point adopted 
and some other uh, publicists, such as Jacquet, discussed. Now, turning again to the process outcome distinction, uh, it is difficult to speak of CIL formation. It is not, in my opinion, entirely impossible, but it is indeed, um, there is indeed a, a, a great uh, amount of uncertainty in terms of how CIL forms. This is the reason it makes more sense to discuss how the rules are, are identified. And, uh, and this is not only in terms of the many theories of CIL that are, are, are out there, and this includes theories that uh, take a much broader view of international law, including, for instance, the New Haven School, um, but also uh, positivists who uh, were very influential in, in, in um, established areas of the law. So to give an example, Robert Togo, which, uh, whom uh, those who have a familiarity with the law of state responsibility uh, will remember, he uh, uh, conceived of custom as a, a spontaneous body of law. It will just get, um, arise out of the blue. So there is this, oh, this um, uh, lack of, 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 of clarity, and this is the reason we speak of identification. Turning to the elements of, 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 um, of custom, um, there, are, there is um, uh, a, a consensus among most uh, practitioners and also in, in academia to a, to a greater or lesser extent that there are two elements to, 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 to custom, which is practice and opinion juris or juris. Um, in terms of practice, there is an important element, and this might have to, uh, this, this might be important to uh, Panos's project, and I think it, it has an influence in, in all the areas where, where CIL is applied, which is the fact that practice is not just merely practice. Practice is um, the behavior of states, the conduct of states, as the main uh, lawmaking uh, um, subjects in international law, which has, as the ICJ put it in the North Sea Continental Shelf cases, the ability to create a norm, a norm-making ability. So it's not just any practice. So I believe that this um, normative nature of practice in itself um, has inherent uh, hermeneutical aspects. Because if you want to establish whether a practice is normative, in a way you may be engaging in an exercise of interpretation. We will turn to this later. Um, turning to opinion juris, um, there is the issue of uh, how much opinion <coughs> is needed for a CIL norm to arise. And this may be an issue that might be of relevance to international investment law. Uh, among the many um, um, theories discussed in this aspect, you have uh, Kyrgyz's uh, notion of the sliding scale, that depending on the area where, CI, where a CIL rule forms, there may, there may be more practice than opinion juries or vice versa, and there, is, uh, there are many debates uh, around this issue. Turning to the function of uh, CIL, uh, the, there is this idea that because CIL is not, uh, does not take necessarily the, the form of a text, therefore that it, is, mm, that it lacks clarity and is uncertain. I believe this is partly untrue, but there is also some, some, some justification to have this belief. Turning to identification, um, there are uh, several uh, issues including at the very uh, foundational aspect of what are the rules on identification of, of CIL. Are those rules legal? Because, you know, we tend to speak of the theory of sources of law and the theory of CIL, but there is not much about what is the actual law on the topic. This is partly what Panosis is doing, and I did that in my, in my doctoral project. Now, turning to um, uh, issues of uh, uh, concerning identification and, and practice, there is a big debate on the concept of practice itself. Not only its normative nature, as I just indicated, but also uh, the issue of whether practice is only physical or whether it could also um, include other forms of behavior, which are statements, verbal statements, sta statements in writing. <coughs> the modern position is that it need not be physical practice in the sense of uh, an act of a state implementing a certain uh, rule that they regard as uh, binding, but rather uh, 
uh, all this uh, behavior as it is expressed in writing statements or even statements uh, that are verbal. Uh, although this leads to other debates, such as the so-called double counting uh, issue, which is the case where you are trying to establish the existence of CIL by reference to the same statements. So it may be the case that you have rules of CIL that do not exist because you are basically conflating practice in the form of a statement with opinion juries for that rule in the form of that very statement. So this is a, an, an issue that might be of interest. Um, there is another issue turning to opinion juries, and is this conception, it, it, it relates to the different conceptions of opinion juries. So the, the more common conception of opinion juries is that opinion juries is the belief <coughs> that the rule is binding. The belief is not necessarily consent. But on the other hand, depending on what position uh, is taken regarding the nature of international law, you may come across consensual representations of, of opinion juris, where opinion juris is not merely a belief, is a form of will, a state will accepting the customary rule. This is in the more voluntarist schools, and they find a lot, they found a lot of acceptance in, 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 the, in the Soviet school of international law, if you like. Then turning to interpretation, um, among the many issues, one important issue is what is the place of the codificatory instrument? We have just mentioned that one of the general properties of CIL is that it is an unwritten form of law, typically. But what happens when you have an instrument that intends to codificate that law? What is the value of that instrument and to what extent that instrument is creating the law or not in terms of influencing the content to, to, to an extent that it is creative? And this also uh, overlaps with the um, unresolved issue of whether, for instance, the ILC has a mandate to codify the law or to create the law, how, how, how the two mandates are um, balanced. Uh, and then lastly, there is a, a new interesting theory, which I think is very interesting to uh, the Panos' project and the issue <coughs> we will face now, which is to what extent an interpretation has what uh, Duncan B. Hollis uh, has called an existential role, meaning an interpretation that is not only ascertaining the content of the rule, but in a way is creating the rule, or is stating that the rule doesn't exist or that it is modified. So there, is, um, the, the, there are all these instances where we feel that, uh, for instance, a judicial authority settling a given dispute and applying a given CIA rule is not only interpreting the rule, but it's as a matter of fact changing the rule. And this is a big debate, and uh, although I'm not um, persuaded that an interpretation actually has an actual existential function, this concept I find it interesting because it uh, illustrates how interpretation and identification may conflict, and how it is sometimes difficult to distinguish the two. And I think, OK, here we go. So turning to identification in international investment law. As you may see, I may or may not be able to cover entirely the subject, but um, I believe there are three aspects that could basically be of interest. Uh, in general, um, in terms of um, how CIL is seen in investment law, there is consensus that the two element approach of a state and opinion juries is accepted. In this sense, you may consult the work of Patrick Donberry, who conducted a study of uh, arbitrary practice to come to this conclusion. There are also many debates uh, which are not contemporary on um, the various ways on which one can establish practice. So earlier there was uh, this movement called the New International Economic Order Movement, and, the, and they used to rely a lot on United Nations General Assembly resolutions. And there was this uh, general debate on whether the Unger resolutions had or, had or did not have uh, the uh, character of practice leading to the establishment of custom. And this leads to the is issue of double counting that I just mentioned in the, in the first part. Um, turning to the function of CIL in investment law, uh, there are two aspects which are of interest. One is the contestation by non-Western states, now less so, because we have identified a trend in investment law, which is that uh, 
as states go from developing to develop economically, their stance on the content of investment law changes because they have an interest in protecting their nationals and therefore more restrictive instances that they adopted previously are no longer defended by them. So this is the reason this uh, critique has uh, lost uh, uh, currency, but it was a debate and it relates a lot and it um, relied a lot on voluntary conceptions of, of consent. And the argument went basically in this sense. We never agreed to X or Y rule of CIL in, in, in investment law. And this was uh, an argument that was also raised by the new states after the period of decolonization. Um, and, uh, another aspect is obviously the more uh, um, obvious one, which is this. Uh, currently, there are a, a number of 3,000 bilateral investment treaties in addition to various multilateral investment treaties, some more limited than others. Uh, the bigger one being, well, one of the, more, uh, of the major ones being the uh, Energy Charter Treaty, which is discussed later. In the presence of what has been called the treatification of investment law, what is the role of CIL? It remains very relevant if for reasons that seem obvious to a public international lawyer, but this is another issue concerning the, the, the general aspects of CIL in investment law. Uh, in turning to arbitral practice and treaty practice, um, and in a way leaving theory behind for a bit, um, there is a criticism of the use of CIL by arbitral tribunals. So in essence, uh, a very strong critique of that has been uh, Professor Sonaraya, who says that arbitral tribunals the, the, the CIL on investment based on secondary sources, based on other arbitral decisions, but there is actually no uh, state practice behind the rules. And this is a criticism that may have some truth to itself, but not entirely, but we'll see. Um, there is indeed uh, an over-reliance on decisions of international courts and tribunals. There is some, it tends to be the case that there is very little uh, discussion of actual state practice in support of CIL rules and investment law. But now turning to treaty practice, a very interesting feature that I have observed recently, and here I speak for instance <coughs> of the Singapore BIT practice, is the fact that um, now there are rules uh, the, the, the VITs have become so specialized, it is, uh, ha, ha, the hypothesis is that this greater specificity in the content of VITs is a response by states to uh, many of the um, uh, frustration with the arbitral decisions that were not consistent, and not only were not consistent, but tended to um, adopt various interpretations of very, um, of very wide open-ended treaty rules. Uh, in response to this, the VITs have become more specific and surprisingly, now some VITs, and I have uh, chosen the Nigeria-Singapore VIT, which has been signed but has not yet entered into force, contain rules regarding the very identification of CIL. So there is, for instance, for footnote four to article two, I believe, of that treaty, um, which is there. So if you look at footnote, oh, and, and my time is up, so uh, there is, if you look at footnote four, if you can see, you will see that um, there is a, re a recognition of the two elements of custom. So this is just to exemplify that CIL is not, is not that abstract, uh, and the states are taking an interest in, in its elements. And uh, I believe I should uh, wrap up for you now. You have to wrap up. Yes, I'll just wrap yes. Otherwise, others will not have time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but happy to take more questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.